Gentlemen, thank you again for joining us. Uh, this time we have one on the panel. The one is an expert, the one is an investor, and it's no other than Karthik. But before I introduce him, I'm going to go through some housekeeping just a little bit for you before we start the show. Again, we are streaming on multiple platforms at the moment. So pick your poison. If you like LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, we are almost on all of them, especially on YouTube and our main page itself. Now, on our main page, you can look at the schedule of events and all our past, previous, future shows that are coming up. So what you can do is you can bookmark, you can look at all the investors speaking on that show, and you can also reach out. So take this opportunity, reach out to me, the team at LaToken, if you want to speak directly to the investors, pitch your ideas, and talk about what we talk about on the show as well. So today, we're going to talk about entertainment, gaming, and esports. It's huge, it's big, and it's continuing its growth. My name is Terence from LaToken, and you're watching VCTV. Now, I'm going to pass the floor to Kartik to quickly introduce himself, if you don't know who he is, and talk about some of the companies that he represents. Kartik, over to you. Thank you so much, Terence, and a happy new year to all the viewers. Uh, it's good to be back on a bright, sunny afternoon, win a wintry afternoon, the way I look at it in the Middle East. Show number 41, Terence, as the count keeps growing every day. Nice. Uh, <laughs> I head a large retail business, and apart from that, I also am a representative of a family office of two large investment houses in the Middle in, in uh, UK. I also represent two venture capital funds based out of the Middle East, primarily the funding Series A and uh, angel investments, typically in fintech, in health tech, and a little bit in the nuclear tech space as well. Esports is something that is more out of an interest and about active involvement with certain celebrities and certain business houses, and a very keen association with ESPN from a support and advisory point of view. And I'd like mm -hmm. to start by giving you a very interesting perspective, Terence. Uh, I was talking to somebody in ESPN just about uh, middle of December, and uh, on an average, on this planet, people spend 900 million hours a day on active sport, fitness, and lifestyle. That's the quantum <laughs> of sports and fitness that is being consumed by people across the world. 900 million. That is just a tad little lower than a billion, which necessarily means one seventh of the world's population plays a sport every day for one hour. And that's huge. And that's great news, actually. <laughs> yeah. During the peak of pandemic in April, the world spent 1.6 billion hours a day on esports and online gaming. So, in that particular period, the business or the esport and gaming activity already took over the physical gaming activity, which has been in the business for thousands of years of human existence by almost 160%. And that is what esports, the power of esports is. What used to be a game online or what used to be an arcade activity online has now burst into the mainstream, transforming from a vibrant niche to a mainstream entertainment around the world. What it used to be a subset of a sports culture many years ago has now become a mainstream industry of its kind. The changes happen because of multiple things. One is obviously because of the way technology has evolved. But more importantly, it has been led as an influencer and a celebrity-led activity. So what Michael Jordan's done, what Drake's done, what Marshmallow has done, or for that matter, even what Azra Ahmud has done in the Middle East, or what Zara has been doing in Saudi, is revolutionizing the sports industry, or, or for that matter, what Mohamed Salah has been doing in Egypt is revolutionizing the sports industry and moving it into a digitalized sports industry. Now that necessarily means, it doesn't necessarily mean people are not spending time on the sport, on the field, but it means people are complementing their on-field activities with a lot of off-the-field activity. And it continues to grow at 28 to 30% year on year. Considering the kind of investments we are seeing in this year, Terence, I would be surprised if typically nine and a half to 10 billion would easily be invested in the first quarter in the esports. Now that doesn't necessarily go into only building infrastructure or into building platforms. That goes into even creating a mainstream ecosystem, which is funded largely 
by large sports houses, funded by large celebrities, funded by large telecom businesses, funded by large retail businesses, and more importantly, goes towards gamification of the entire business because to draw interest and to drive interest, the activity needs to be marketed, marketed well, needs to be gamified well. Now that gamification sucks up a lot of dollar. So while the deals in the uh, in the venture space would be limited to a billion or two, a lot of money would go down into driving those businesses. And that is where we see the acquisition, Will Smith's investments of over 30, 40 million dollars into this business, or mm -hmm. even Tencent acquiring Eurocell to a large extent, one of the Chinese companies going mainstream and less listing on NASDAQ, electronic mm -hmm. arts, exchanging hands for three to four times in a period of two years is an indication that esports and gaming is a sunrise industry for Puerto Rico. Specifically, if I were to give you a geographical indication, started with Japan, started with Korea, and has now become a mainstream in Southeast Asia, which typically means Malaysia, Philippines, Taiwan, Indonesia, picking up very rapidly in uh, Middle East, specifically Middle Eastern summers, are all about esports because people find it difficult to go out. And it has become a summer alternative and a winter alternative in certain parts of the world. If you see the consumption of esports during in Russia or in Canada during the March or uh, during October to March, you'd realize a 72% increase in the consumption, which is where the downloads and multiplayer arenas become a very difficult place mm. to be. Multiplayer arena typically has a seven second wait time in almost all the games. If you go on to any gaming platform and evaluate its presence during September to March in Russia or Canada, you would realize a 24 to 27 second wait time where you need to be available on the platform before somebody lets you in. Now that is the level of complexity and competition we have reached in this space. And it's only, it's only growing. Right, right. Thank you for that, Karthik. I think that's a brilliant lay of the land just to kind of uh, give an introduction to what we're talking about today. And you're right to kind of quote uh, the investors and, and, and the top guys in, in current ESPN and some networks at the moment, because I, I've heard this before as well. They have said that esports will rival the biggest traditional sporting leads in terms of opportunity and, and ticket sales and so on and so forth. And to having to kind of continue on from that point itself, I think it's important that we talk about the whole landscape at the moment. Let's talk about the parties involved. Uh, could you give us, uh, again, a quick uh, rundown on all of that? So let me tell, give you a perspective. In the, in the sports arena, in the sporting business, Everybody makes dollar and not everybody spends dollars. So mm. all of us are used to the idea that sports means an active arena and we go to a stadium, we watch sports, so we switch on our TV and we watch sports and that's where the money comes in. Not necessarily. Subscription and ticket sales in a sporting mm. business account for just about 5 to 6% of the entire revenue that a sport activity generates into the GDP. Primary mm. income comes from your broadcast rights. It comes from the sponsorships, right? Sponsorships that come into it. It comes from the merchandising rights. And when you layer it onto a esport platform, the biggest beneficiary and the parties onto it are your network providers, typically your mm -hmm. telecom providers. Because look at look at the perspective. PUBG as a game is a 2 GB game with a live network of 21 to 22 MB at any point in time, which means the network consumption, the bandwidth consumption is mm -hmm. massive. Until unless you have network providers that are able to support and grow out of it, which requires massive infrastructure and networks availability, it's not possible. The biggest party and the biggest beneficiary in this entire ecosystem is your network provider. That's mm. Second, typically, if you know Super Bowl used to, a, a 10 second spot on a Super Bowl was some, in the past valued at anything between 12 to 15 million. At some point, when Coca-Cola used to bring in those Michael Jackson ads, it was 20 mm. million that they used to pay. The same thing has changed. If you look at the esports arena, the boards around the football field in the esports arena, the logos, the dress, or, 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 or the logo on the players' dresses, the logo on the arena, logo on the football field, logo everywhere else is commercialized. Which means today, a gaming platform, either multiplayer or live or inherent or native generates 18 to 20 percent revenue from sponsorship from mm. rights and from advertising revenue and that advertising revenue now also goes into creating revenue 
of the digital channel, which is it's not only an in-game revenue, but revenue generated through billboards, through messages, through digital advertising, through social media. Another big opportunity for revenue, which is which is typically the advertising revenue, as I continue to say, is mm-hmm. every game has layers. So, for example, if I'm playing a cricket match online, uh, every over, which is typically four and a half minutes, there is a changeover. In that changeover, there are 20 to 10 to 20 second advertisements that are squeezed in by these mm-hmm. gaming players, which typically account for nine to 10 percent of the revenue that they make because that is a place where a, a user wouldn't want to lose concentration or a player wouldn't want to lose focus and has to go through it. These are not even clickable ads. So these are not even swipe through ads. These are ads that one has to go through, which becomes obtrusive at times, but it becomes a very strong revenue stream. Then comes the merchandising. PUBG merchandising, Need for Speed merchandising, (laughs) Royal Rumble WWF merchandising. You see the kind of stuff available in the supermarkets. There is an entire PUBG range available. You'd be surprised. Saul in in Korea has a PUBG store. Yeah, yeah. I Did think I've seen PUBG pictures stores? of that. <laughs> so now that PUBG stores, PUBG memorabilia, Call of Duty memorabilia, Need for Speed models, different cars that you see in Need for Speed games are available in almost every Hamleys and uh, Toys R Us. So you've mm. taken that to a very different level of sport memorabilia. Then you get into the rights that have been given. So for example, if there's a, if there's a multiplayer tournament that is being uh, created and showcased, YouTube takes the rights to broadcast it globally. Facebook takes the rights to stream it globally. So what, you you actually feel like you're watching a match the way you watch a match on your TV is the way you watch watch a match on an arena or on an e-platform. And then comes the last, which slowly is gaining traction. The industry was late to run and is in-app purchases. Mm-hmm. Let's say I'm playing Call of Duty or I'm playing PUBG. The number of times I need to go to the store to buy things, to upgrade my level, to upgrade my skill, to upgrade my arsenal, to buy games, whatever, whatever stuff that I need is the last. People thought in the beginning that might not amount to and people wouldn't pay price for it. But I think this is this is becoming a big change in terms of what people require and where people need to move. So mm-hmm. that that is one, one large element uh, that comes on to it. The next big element is the gamification. Let's say I create reward systems for you that, uh, you know, Terence, you come and play Call of Duty, you re- create this, you win this much, uh, you have these many points coming to you, that points can be re- sourced or can be exchanged at your nearest McDonald's, you win Call of Duty, reach level 10, you can buy a free burger, reach level 20, you can get a free Starbucks coffee. Now that is a on and off convergence, which is an online offline convergence into your physical world, which means the game has already reached your physical world from an online space. Now, with Mm. these many parties involved in it, what used to be a hobby or a 20-minute entertainment between two lessons or two meetings has necessarily now become a thriving industry of its own. And with guys like Hero Capital, who's just about invested 110 million million in creating a hotshot ecosystem, typically a digital sports fund, which creates and incubates esports learning, esports building, in South Asia, I think there's there's going to be a lot more enthusiasts who have game ideas coming on the table and creating more game platforms. Right, right. Yeah, I think we have all seen some of the investments that are coming through as well, and those are big numbers. But as an investor yourself, I mean, I'm curious to know, and I'm sure some of the businesses viewing out there as well, they will want to know. What is your focus at the moment? Are you focusing on the players, the teams, the leagues? Or are we talking about the publishers themselves? Uh, are you having a particular focus or are your peers talking about it? Could you give us I a... Think, yeah. I look at it differently. Uh, I look at it differently. If you, if, you want to, if you are a football fan, you'd realize the dollars that move between an European Premier League and buying an Arsenal and buying a Liverpool and buying a Manchester and a United and owning those teams. Hmm. Next few years, maybe by 2027, 2028, you would have businesses that would be buying an Arsenal on- online, buying a Liverpool online and playing European Premier- English Premier League online. <coughs> That's where the business would move. Investments in this space, if I were a pure play investor and the way the business moves is, you might not have the bandwidth and an ability to invest in a gaming arena at the moment because that 
while everybody wants to come up with games the challenge is not tell us about getting your game built it's about democratizing mm. your game there would be a million games in the arcade space or the first person shootout space but it's only call of duty and pubg that have made it to the certain level because that it comes in with a very strong support it comes in with 12 to 15 generations already planned in advance because there would be people with different now if i go with the joe blog logic of working the building the game based on average person speed there would be 20 to 25% of the people who would have mastered it by that time and would be shocked to see that the game doesn't have certain level so i will always need to keep the game ahead of the market in terms of its advancements and developments now that comes in when i have massive bandwidth to build the dimensions of the game creating a game either on the platform or even building multiplayer arenas is an extremely challenging task it is not as easy as one thinks of so that is something that boys in the big in the big boys league which is typically either electronic arts or a tent uh, tent cent or an nintendo or anybody else would want to keep it to themselves but what works is that small thriving ecosystems of ad creators content creators graphic creators memorabilia businesses licenses at uh, a regionalization of a particular game voice overs in a particular game snippets of particular games now that is where there's a lot of in- investments coming in right right business we are funding in and if you see windex windex has launched a 60 million fund only to regionalize certain games in southeast asia hero has mm-hmm. launched a particular print 100 thieves has created a lot of gaming platforms in this part of the world by investing as much as 200 250 million dollars in this part of the world what everybody tries to do is try and increase your spare time utilization on the back mm-hmm. and then kind of riding on that point as well i mean is there like current monetization strategies that you're seeing uh, emerging is there a trend coming or yes. what's what's like the best way to kind of do this can you talk us through So, so see monetizing this entire industry terrence is going to require mm-hmm. two to three uh, levels one is commercializing the game the moment mm-hmm. you come like commercialize a game you would require first massive investments to make me download the game because you would then need to reach me at least 8 to 10 times unlike a product purchase mm-hmm. which is a 2 to 3x frequency on my social media and then driving me onto a purchase or driving me onto at least a cart position a game download is a 7x to 8x because it you need you need to be very very sharp in in the kind of games i like let's say you are a game creator and you want to reach out to me now you would only know what kind of a game i like or you would know only, you would only know that i like esports you would be very sure, you would be very surprised to see my interest in certain esports and hence you would reach out to me with every kind of game Un- unfortunately unlike a, a lot of e-commerce purchases gaming still hasn't reached the level of categorization that it needs to do which is strategy games arcade games mind bender games first person games soccer games etc it hasn't been categorized well and hence the moment somebody realizes that he's been on a gaming arena he's bombarded with every possible game now that necessarily means i'll only look at one out of 12 one out of 12 in into three much to three frequencies you're talking about one out of 36 which is a 2 to 3% success rate on a game which means you need to spend millions of dollars to get me to like your game mm. making you like your game at a commercial level is the first part of it if you're going to charge me for it i'll never i'll never come to you so you need to mm. give me a free game you need to make the game easy for me for the first few levels because there there are only there's only that one or two percent of the geeks who like to take gaming as a challenge terence the rest of mm. them they lose the first to two three levels they lose interest and they walk out saying that this game is either too difficult for me or it's 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 occupying too much of my mind space and time space so you need to make the first two levels easy creating those levels wherein you incentivize me to play your game and keep coming to your game again and again the reason why pubg works is because per capita consumption of pubg pubg players in mm. a week is 23 hours terence which means typically set 3 <laughs> hours a day is what people play pubg now if yeah. that is the level of commercialization that you are able to build into the game then you have network providers who will soon over you you have merchandisers who would go red making merchandise for you and would always be short in supply you would have advertisers making a beeline at your game because you exposing the brand 7 into 3 22 to 23 hours a week that is massive even no tv show can do that to that extent 
even yeah. netflix would fail to do that you 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 keeping me glued to a particular screen particular set of characters 3 hours a day that is the best on site advertising avenue or uh, source that one can cre- create which means to kill create the entire ecosystem viable robust and live what necessary needs to make sure the game is in my top of the mind top of the space top of the thumb scroll positions that's one second mm-hmm. more importantly is you need to keep me interested in your game which means you need to let me win but you also need to get me come back to you again and again the moment i get, get over you as a game which is what happened with the sniper sniper 3 had a beautiful gaming arcade had a beautiful interactive design but it mm-hmm. made you play too quickly so i could finish my 12 levels in 3 days and then i don't need the game because the game didn't build on to it right right so i think you that's how you commercialize a game in terms of your contractual engagements it depends on what level of the gaming activity do you wish to get into your franchising you wish to get into your merchandising and you wish to get into your advertising revenue you need to be at the right time because if you are too late you lost a lot of dollars on the table if you are too early you won't get the dollars on the table because if i if i launch a game and i go come to you and say terence i have launched a game you would say you know but take a high get me a million users and then i'll put the dollar on the table and if i come to you with 3 million users i would have lost the first 2 million users revenue from you so that that timing is very right now that requires a lot of endorsements more importantly are you creating a culture are you creating a cult are you creating superstars around you which necessarily means have you created online gaming competitions where people have been waiting for those multiplayer games have you created celebrities like today if a mohammed salah is a celebrity in the middle east in the football world mm-hmm. have you created, or parallel mohammed salah in the online gaming world if let's say uh, hamilton is a formula 1 uh, celebrity have you created a nascar or have you created a need for speed celebrity in the e space if yes your game has a parallel viewership then you would compete on a such sunday evening where you would be queuing either for a formula 1 or would you be queuing for a need sports need for speed arena you see mm. because that is far more human here is a celebrity but there the guy who wins there is a joe block next door neighbor and that is what drives more involvement because that is where you make the human being into a celebrity here in formula 1 is a celebrity is a celebrity so that's that's how that that's how the proximity and the association with the gaming industry it, it builds you can see yourself winning if you don't require those skills apart from the ability to win which 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 makes it all the more involving all the more invigorating for me there mm. i think and i think that's also part of the point and and that facilitates growth definitely because lots of people can get involved in multiple capacities and then they in turn can become superstars in their own fields even from commenting even from playing and so on so forth but we look at the industry as well as how we look at other businesses and i'm sure that some of the businesses out there are also wanting to know uh the investors point of view again uh how are you and your peers kind of looking at this commercially or even investing in it so who are the top investors where is the investments coming from and could you perhaps give an example of some of the deals that you are hearing so some of the deals that are on the on the table which have which have become cults in last two years is obviously the will smith deal mm. electronic arts being bought over tencent and uh, uh, investing money 100 thieves getting a 110 million fund created specifically to create gaming arenas and to create e gaming competitions e gaming competitions is where there is a lot of money being created we being put mm. pandemic opened up more doors for it because people people to people connect and people got used to the virtual world when people got used to ordering food online when people got used to meeting friends and socializing online people got used to working online gaming online is also a placebo in the ecosystem which makes the ecosystem that much more friendlier so that mm. is where a lot of investments have come in investments these days and i i, I don't remember the name of the firm that i uh, spoke to a few weeks ago but i necessarily remember about them investing in gamifying which means they have created the while i am not an expert on bitcoin but they've created a blockchain or a bit a crypto based gaming platform which necessarily rewards you at certain level and starts sparking your wins into a certain arena but hmm. 
lot of money is going into the old economy supporting the new economy which is the manufacturing se sector creating specific licensing rights for the franchising of these games and for the merchandising of these games and a lot of money is going into the technology bandwidth space which creates certain in app platforms or multiplayer gaming platforms mm mm yeah you're right and and with that as well could you kind of give us your idea or your insights into up and coming esport trends i mean do you see any or what makes a successful company just to kind of put it bluntly so a successful company terence would necessarily be and this is one space where one needs to be a visionary visionary very strong pulse of the consumer because you you don't know who the consumer is i mean my daughter and me at times play almost the same games which necessarily means that your consumer is not defined by age your consumer is not defined by geography your consumer is not defined by gender but the consumer is defined by your mindset and hence you need to pick up different mindsets am i winning the arcade mindset am i winning the two person mindset am i winning a fight mindset or am i looking at a strategy mindset which mindset am i targeting age gender is no bar any longer more importantly how much of a technology prowess do you have because this is graphics technology mm. at its best if you do not have that bandwidth available with you and if you do not have that infrastructure available with you i don't think you should try because there's no place for second there's no place for a second first i mean second layer third tier game in this you would end up burning your dollars and would not reach third how much of a thought process have you built into or what level of advancements have you built some people try and make a perpetual game which is a game which is an endless game as they call it sim city is one example of it which is an endless game you can take the game wherever you wish to and it will never end age of the empires was an endless game and it took people years and years to play but that was when people had that much time and that much attention span people today expect a gaming arena to change at least every 24 hours to 48 hours i don't want to be on the same level more than 3 one day and i don't want to fail on the same level more than 7 uh, seven times in a in a, in a six times in a game which necessarily means you need to bring in a massive layer of ai into it so that it tries and makes sure that through collaborative filtering i'm able to change the game's winning probability at a certain level before the user churns off my platform rather than you know continue and take him to the next level so that requires that massive tech stack successful gaming companies have to be very very successful marketers terence you mm. were talking about reaching out to me in a space where i'm already over communicated i have e-commerce companies reaching out to me i have food delivery companies reaching out to me i would have my organization reaching out to me my school teaching me in the online space my my house is become an online space for me which necessarily means if you want to reach out to me you need to break the clutter get me involved get me activated you need mm. to be a very good marketer to drive me into this space regionalize the game don't try and make it very global which means if i'm on a game and if i have a regional flavor added to a game and then a big success story is some of these card games e-sport games that have come up in in india typically the guys like teenpatti and rummy which is a very very typical asian and indian game but it has massive followings the reason only is because that's a sport that i relate to that's a sport that i play and i'm happy to see people like me on a multiplayer arena or my friends playing are you instead of trying to create a multiplayer arena can i have my own friends arena which means i have 10 friends playing can we all create our own partnership levels and play instead of me playing with strangers so how you democratize the game at a grassroots level if i want to play a game with terence can i play immediately and can i invite you as a player and play or do i have to go into an open arena and play with whoever is my competitor now mm -hmm. that that regionalizing of the game and game and adding regional flavors will make you a successful game bits last most important is are you profit are you are you generating rewards for your entire ecosystem are you able to fuel the bandwidth are you able to fuel the bandwidth are you fueling social media are you fueling your franchise guys are you fueling your sponsors are you getting that many eyeballs on the game or the gaming events if yes you've created a successful game and if you play a successful game you just need to start scaling it up and taking it to wider audiences right and yeah i think you're right definitely right in saying that marketing is key here but to write on that point as well i mean you've seen many and businesses do approach you as well 
do you see like a best practice in terms of structure and format at the moment uh, where the business owners come in with that whole advertising format or franchise format? Or could you give us a... I, I, I see that. I see. And, and you know, the, the, the challenge, which I continue to tell every time in the, in the show talents is, mm. investors have become a little too smart for themselves. Trust me, including me. Uh, a few years ago, somebody would have shown me a lovely picture, a rosy picture, and would have asked me to reach out to the foreign office or the fund office and say, you know what, let's park a few million dollars here. But today, this mm. is very different. VCs have been have smartened themselves up by spate of losses in the last few years, primarily in this mm. space. Not only in the esports, but in multiple spaces. And I, I still see a lot of enthusiasts coming up with an idea of, I have an idea and I want to multiply it and create wealth for myself. Now, when you come to an idea and when you come to a venture fund with an idea of only multiplying wealth, then you are coming in with an extremely capitalistic mindset. An extremely capitalistic mindset only becomes greedier as we go. You need mm -hmm. to come up with a very strong gaming idea, a sporting idea, which builds onto the sporting ecosystem. If you can build onto the ecosystem, if you come with a unique game concept, if you come up with pure play graphic enhancements, if you come up with technology development or technology enhancements on your platform, then commercializing is, is an offshoot that can be built around it. But if you come with an idea that I want sponsorship revenues only and I want bandwidth revenues only, then what you're coming is you're coming with an idea that I want to become a millionaire overnight. And trust me, mm. no, become, nobody becomes a millionaire overnight. Otherwise, I wouldn't be sitting here and giving advice, right? Sharon? I would have a yacht <laughs> for the ocean. Yes, and I'll be playing esports on that yacht as well. <laughs> okay. So when people come with that, they still, and, and again, the challenge in, in the smaller businesses, the larger businesses have wor worked well. The smaller businesses come with multiple elements missing. So they come with, and, I, and in fact, there was a beautiful uh, gaming op gaming esport opportunity from a state in uh, India, I mean, from uh, West Bengal in India. Mm. Group of three friends, tech stack developers, beautiful game, a local game, but they had absolutely no idea of how to commercialize it. Now, when you come with that, it becomes very difficult for a, for a, for a partner or for an investor to fund you because this is still not a space where the entire infrastructure is built with an investor. If you come into an e-commerce space with, with just a thought that there would be already an ecosystem built with an investor and he would tell you that, okay, I have my entire incubating space, please use it to build. But here, people don't have marketing bandwidth available, people don't have franchising rights available, people don't have the entire commercial ecosystem available. So come back with that as a thought in mind that what are the three to four surround or what are the concentric ecosystems that you need to build around and then come to an investor with a thought the dev dollars would be massive. So I don't expect somebody to come with a friends and family proposal put together saying I have my $50,000 and I've started work. It will not work. If you have a good idea and if you've created certain wireframes and if you've created a user journey on the, on, on, a, on a, if even if not an in-app, but a graphical user journey or a graphical representation of your game. And if you have a game idea ready, there would be enough people to fund it, provided you have a last mile on the game built, which means how is the, how are you going to, get the consumer to like you, how are you going to get the user to repeat you and how are you going to make it a cult or a phenomenon for people to follow you. It's not just about playing you. It's about playing you, liking you, replaying you and the rest of them watching you. Only then you're a successful business and that thought has to be very, very clear in people's mind. Right. And I think throughout the show as well, we have been talking about almost the positive sides of esports and the growth and how successful it can be. But I'm sure there's some downsides as well. Do you see any or have you seen any downsides within the industry or some examples that uh, the viewers out there should not repeat? <laughs> so I see a lot. I see it becoming an addiction of, of its kind. I also see it becoming a mainstream activity and reason for a lot of procrastination in multiple spaces. More importantly, it becomes a reason for a lot of mental disorders and it becomes a persona disorder, which necessarily means you start living in like a PUBG warrior or a Call of Duty soldier. And that's exactly the kind of personality you start manifesting. Not seen too often in, 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 uh, in uh, certain parts, but Southeast Asia, yes. Uh, a lot of aggressiveness, which primarily comes in because of sedentary lifestyle, a lot of obesity, a lot of health disorders, 
but then everything in, in in a balanced proportion keeps you happy everything and balanced balance is going to mm. be how there and so i would while i would look at it in terms of who, what do you do balancing out esports esports has a bright future but uh, balancing it out with uh, as a part of a lifestyle and not just becoming a lifestyle is a caution that i would throw to a lot of users right right and and also with covid and the current pandemic that's hitting us uh this is a positive i'm assuming what are the countries that uh people are looking at and where are all these games coming from or where should people be looking at for those examples you think a lot of games so games are being developed in different parts of the world games mm-hmm. are being consumed in very different parts of the world you would be surprised a lot of kids games are being created in china uh of late at low cost being available because you don't require massive graphics you require certain elements of beauty for kids and certain elements of extravagance and uh, for kids but your first person in arcade games or your multiplayer arcade games your second person arcade games your uh, sniper and fighter games or, or even your simulators are being built in germany they are being built in south asia they build being built i think they are being built in the uk and us as well but a lot of consumption is happening in southeast asia a lot of consumption in the middle east middle eastern consumption on arcade games middle eastern consumptions on multiplayer arena games is massive massive it's a friends and family hobby it's a friends and family activity in the evening to have a group of friends playing games in in, in certain parts of middle east that i have seen Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. So in terms of mergers, acquisitions, any big takeovers, are you seeing any of that coming in the oh, near massive, future? Oh, massive, massive, massive. Hero Capital is mm-hmm. 110 million funding on e-sports, digital sports fund taking over, Tencent mm-hmm. taking over. Then uh, there was about Red Red Knives taking over, 100 teams taking over, Will Smith's game being created or one team that was created with Redbird investing around 125 million. what some of these large large gaming uh, mergers and acquisitions the electronic arts changing hands twice in la- thrice in last 3 4 years is something mm-hmm. that we need to see why is electronic arts changing hands so often but uh, the guys who are coming up with it see the the ones who who going to be successful is typically your uh, nba guys your e- epl guys your mm-hmm. nfl guys the guys who are coming up with that or even the icc cricket championship has become a rage a rage in the e space so while games that have come out as a me too would struggle a little bit games or platforms or e sports that have had history in the past like an epl has had a history an nba has had a history a wwe has had had a history in the offline space for them gaining success on the online space is only becoming that much more easy and which is where there has been massive investments investments on franchising and investments on promoting investments on not 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 investments in building the games because they are already owned and bought over by large businesses right right yep okay i think i think thanks for those points actually it makes perfect sense and it kind of sums up what's happening in the industry today as well and again a message to our viewers uh, from wherever you are if you're watching us on any platform at all again you can contribute as well on the show uh if you are on youtube for example just drop us a comment talk to us about the games that you play uh we want to know we want to read up and we want to know what you're interested in listening to actually so we have a few next shows coming up as well and again as always we have that opportunity for you to get involved pitch directly to our speakers and our vcs and our investors on the channel so we want to hear from you do come on board get in touch with us so again kartik back to us here on the show we're going to round it up and we're going to end the show uh, but before we end i want to give the viewers something to look forward to now if they want to reach out to you if they want to talk to you how best do some of the companies here approach investors like yourself could you just give them a general outline and what you expect from them to be in terms of my remarks on this category terms i would say this is a sunrise industry sunrise industry because it is opening up and it is in line with the new changing lifestyle and new changing social structure that we live in so i would i would i would keep this as 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 an open category where i would personally be looking for deals if i there is any mm-hmm. in terms of reaching out to investors like us i think the best way to reach out us is on our social platforms on linkedin on facebook 
more importantly all of us in some or the other manner are associated with latakin through you even if they were to reach out to you i think i think you've been doing a fabulous job of bridging some of the sectors together and we would continue to do that as we as we build in terms of what people need to reach out to us terence is they need to reach out with a very structured plan with a vision not just with an idea and a mood board an idea and a mood board don't go for too far today a structured thought and a vision and an ability to execute vision a raw materials for success is not just a strategy a strategy and an execution plan people would there would be enough people to fund and put dollars on the table when you have a right strategy and execution plan open to course correction because we are in an extremely fast industry the industry meanders too quickly changes course too quickly and hence you need to be really nimble footed and willing to take risks and willing to course correct right right and to that point as well probably my final question on the show today how would you evaluate some of the companies uh, coming out or have been out in the market how do you normally evaluate them in terms of their success i mean what determines their success and what is success to you so when the companies come to us students at times they come with a very basic raw material more often than not they come with a one page deck now it depends have you been able to summarize your entire business intent in a one page deck if yes beautiful if no do you have a beautiful thought in available do you have the infrastructure available do you have the bandwidth in terms of human capital available do you have even the execution plan available with you and yes then we will fund you and we'll start evaluating the success now some of these successes are going to be really really long long tailed as i look at it which necessarily means that your success would come in only 24 to 48 months down the line if you are a large business if you are a small business 12 to 18 months down the line and hence we need to create milestones milestones about proxy testing milestones about proof of concept milestone about your uts the milestones about layering first layer out into the market milestones about user reviews and then the when the game starts commercializing milestones about number of users milestone about number of subscribers miles milestones about number of downloads milestones about what dollars have you built in from what revenue stream is your subscriber revenue reached a particular level is your in game in an in app revenue reached a particular level and is your advertising revenue reached a level so you build kpi matrices and you start evaluating kpi depending on the business that you are in and for a, in general for for any investment it is very important to build milestones checkpoints and dams to make sure that you are aligned with where and where you take the business otherwise you would need to wait 24 to 48 months in the past it was possible people because there are very few businesses that people would be investing in but today the number of businesses that we are investing is so large and so high that and and everybody doesn't have competencies of every type which means it's best to measure through indicators and kpis that's that's how we measure success we measure success through how democratized the product is how much reach fan following and relevance has it driven and has it delivered the dollars or does it have the, the ability to deliver dollars mm. brilliant i think karthik those are very insightful points that you brought up and spoke on this show today again i can't thank you enough i'm sure the audience out there and all those tuning in or watching us from wherever you are you should be taking notes you should be talking to us more and you should also appear on the show so do keep that in mind and now before we go any final words from you karthik before we say bye i think i think uh, this is this is one sector terence that uh, be happy to support like i said last time when i mm. told the when i when i when i was on live on your show and i told people that i'm happy to support i'm very happy that two startups have reached out to me with mm. a very rough blueprint and uh, have had, have had sought my help in even building a pitch deck for them it's 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 a play is where i would be very happy because i was i i've been lucky enough to be honed and uh, sheltered by a lot of leaders in the past and it's time to give it back to the society so if anybody needs help in this space terence more than happy to support this is a sunrise business for everybody to be a part of brilliant thank you karthik and for those watching as well again thank you for tuning in thank you for making time to get on the show i hope this was insightful for you as it was for me again come back on our next show goodbye and have a great day thank you everyone thank you so much sir and it was lovely talking to you